Late July 1986, Joe Maloney boarded a fishing trawler and left Ireland and almost everything he had behind him. Apart from three things, cash, an unknown third alias identity that he'd used to travel to Canada and Europe while in Ireland, and his third wife, Sheila Chandler O'Shea. I heard on the great when he went to South America. Some people thought he went to Canada. Joe escaped aboard a trawler that steamed out into the Irish Sea. But to where? Yeah, there were rumours he was seen in Spain. You know, he, um, he, he got out to Malta. It could have been Timbuktu. I'm Pavel Barter. From RTE Documentary on One, this is Runaway Joe. Episode 8, Land of Reinvention. During the making of this series, we've heard many stories about where Joe Maloney went when he left Ireland. Most were wild guesses, rumours, speculation without foundation. Joe Maloney left Ireland with the help of his friend, Rod Fenning. They vanished. Rod's sister, Pamela. And nobody knows where they went to. My brother never pretended where it was. But it has to have been somewhere where there was no extradition. So then Sheila stayed on for a little while until Michael got established wherever he was. She would have to go to a place where there's no extradition treaty. Back in 1986, the world was in the grip of the Cold War and divided into two. The capitalist Western bloc of the United States and much of Europe versus the communist-controlled Eastern bloc dominated by the Soviet Union. The divide between both worlds was stark. They were arch enemies. And Ronald Reagan, US president at the time, routinely described communism as a threat. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. The line dividing these two worlds was a physical division in the German city of Berlin, where the Berlin Wall divided east and west. Erica Lotz, the housekeeper at Capard House when Joe Maloney bought it, was a Berliner, and she still remembered locally. She she was in, she was involved in almost every major event in in Ger- you know yeah. she was in Dresden during the bombing she was in the, uh, fascinating Berlin fascinating the survival story yeah, of the Dresden bombing yeah. during World War Two Erica served as a nurse with the German army. Annette O'Sullivan, who had property dealings with Michael O'Shea in Cabard House, remembers Erica well. I knew she was East German, and uh, she told me that uh, she was a gymnast in Berlin, 1936 Olympics. Erica had come to Capard with a previous owner, so when Joe Maloney bought the house, Erica stayed on. She assumed the role of caretaker of Capard and became close friends with Joe Maloney and his wife, Sheila. And one day in 1986, Sheila and Erica arrived into Annette O'Sullivan's workplace. I was um, working in the restaurant in Portlaoise one day, busy at lunchtime, and Erica came in with this lady. She said, um, I want to introduce you to this lady. Um, you know, we're, we're going to visit her husband who's in the prison in Portlaoise. Uh, but I remember the lady as a um, pleasant-looking, nice-looking girl, and they were going to visit Michael O'Shea in Portlaoise prison. You might remember that in our last episode, Bishop Michael Cox regularly visited Capard House during the late 1970s, and he liked to speak German with the housekeeper, Erica Lotz. I used to visit her, and we spoke in German, because I, I was in Germany for two years. And any time anytime she saw me, her eyes would light up. Ah, oh, she have Vader Bazook, come and see Ryan, Mike, sit and see him. <laughs> and when Bishop Cox visited Joe Maloney in Mountjoy Prison in 1985, they conversed in German under the noses of the guards. Michael knew a fair bit of German. 
we learned it. But we, we spoke, started to speak in German in the prison, Mount Jai prison. Oh. <laughs> we believe that during his time in Kapard, both Joe Maloney and his wife Sheila learned German from Erica. By 1986, a grand plan of escape had come together for Joe Maloney, and this was gifted to him on a plate by the Irish government when the extradition treaty with the US collapsed. One of the good things that came from the former East Germany was their music. The national anthem, resurrected out of ruins, is still considered one of the best anthems ever composed. That music also gives us a clue as to where we're going next. Not long after leaving Dublin, Morris O'Callaghan, who'd worked with Joe Maloney, began hearing some solid indications about where he might have gone. He disappeared when we heard that he had gone to some country then that didn't have an extradition treaty. First thing we heard was that he had gone to Germany. After that, we didn't know where. We've also met Fiona Deverell in previous episodes. Her father was friends with Joe Maloney. My father had this theory. He went to East Germany. And I was like, why? Why do you think he went to East Germany, Dad? And he said, because I heard him on the phone speaking German fluently. And I think he has contacts over there. In the early 2000s, someone found more definitive information pointing to Joe Maloney having gone to East Germany. It was a hot summer's day in 2001 when I walked into the foyer of a post office in Ames, Iowa. Over 20 years ago, an English writer and musician called Michael Nage was travelling through America when he spotted a wanted poster. A board to my right displayed a long line of fugitives from justice. I glanced, then stared. The oldest poster dated back to 1967. Joseph Michael Maloney. 34 years on the run. How had he managed that, I wondered? Had he been recaptured or died long ago? Michael has since died, but before his passing, he detailed his discoveries in a series of emails to friends of June Fisk, Joe Maloney's wife, who Joe was accused of killing. June's friends, in turn, passed Nage's testimony on to us. Nage, much like ourselves, had become obsessed with the story of Joe Maloney, so much so that he travelled to Ireland. His words are read here by an actor. I speculated if he was still alive and still with Sheila O'Shea, who was 10 years younger. Given that she wasn't wanted for anything, I figured that she would almost certainly keep in contact with her family and maybe even visit them. And maybe Joe did too, on a false passport. Michael Nage was hoping to write a biography of Joe Maloney, so he was trying to find out where Joe and his wife Sheila were hiding out. By now, he'd gone undercover outside Sheila's family home in South County Dublin. I spent the Christmas and New Year of 2003 observing her parents' house, shivering and feeling rather silly. Nage then made his way down to Capard House in County Leash, which had been bought and sold a number of times since Joe and Sheila owned it. But one thing hadn't changed about the estate. I was led into a kitchen where his former housekeeper was enjoying her cigarette. Erica Lotz was still living at Capard. In fact, by now, 2003, she'd been here for over 40 years. Michael Nage began talking to Erica, who'd spent 10 years with Joe Maloney and his wife Sheila. And Erica began to tell Nage all about Joe. On the one hand, she had been well treated by him and she liked him a great deal. On the other, from her dealings with the journalists that followed his arrest, she believed the evidence against him and was appalled by what he had done. Then she told me what I wanted, and by now probably needed to know. After Michael's release in 1986, Rod Fenning helped smuggle him out of the country on a trawler. He made it across mainland Europe to East Berlin. East Berlin. 
a place with no extradition treaty with the United States, somewhere Erica Lotz had connections, and with a language that Joe Maloney and his wife Sheila both spoke. The dots appeared to be adding up. Nächste Station, Hauptbahnhof. Übergang zur U-Bahn-Linie 5 und zum Regional- und Fernverkehr. I'm in Berlin, trying to see if Maloney and Sheila left any shadows behind, any clues they were here. So I'm on the U-Bahn in Berlin. Joe arrived here in August 1986, and it wasn't until a few months after that that Sheila joined him. It would have provided a safe haven at the time. It was, of course, East Berlin was behind the wall. It was in DDR, the German Democratic Republic. There would have been no extradition treaty. They would have been out of sight, out of mind. Within the GDR, they had surveillance, surveillance of every citizen in there, particularly citizens who came from the West. So I'm going to the Stasi archives here. The Stasi, of course, were the secret police who monitored everyone covertly and overtly. They may have come here under assumed identities. Certainly, Joe probably did. But I'm hoping that the Stasi archives might be able to tell me more. My name is Oskar Böhm. I'm a clerk at the Stasi Record Archive, which is part of the Federal Archive in Germany. There were a lot of Western citizens who tried to um, move to the GDR because they were criminals and they wanted to um, escape from prosecution. So what was the process? Let's say it was 1986, you're from the West and you want to move to East Berlin. They were put in a certain a central admission center. It was in Röntgenthal, close to Berlin. And you had to stay there for like 30 days, even more. And people were prepared there for the socialist um, society. And they were under surveillance. And they were interrogated uh, about their life because the GDR was always afraid that spies could come from the Western states. The case, specific case I'm researching, the couple could both speak German. They also knew someone who lived in East Berlin. Do you think these things might have helped? I think speaking German would be easier to convince the Stasi um, or the people who interrogated you to, to make your point clear why you, you were coming and why you are motivated to, to be integrated in the socialist society. Once in the GDR, the Stasi had eyes on you, whoever you were, and they kept files. I wondered if they'd recorded anything on Joe Maloney and his wife, Sheila Chandler. So did you have a chance to have a look at my request, my query? Uh, and, the, and the person who I'm looking for information about. We found one file, but it, it's still on the way to, to, to my office, so uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't read it yet. So you found a file? I found a file that might have information about the people you are looking for. While waiting for those files, which took a few weeks to retrieve, we spoke with information specialist Ulrike Neuendorf, who has knowledge of the Stasi's formula of surveillance and control. If you were to try to get into the GDR, you would have had to go through um, a process of um, having several checks done by the Stasi. Once in East Germany, the Stasi could use you like a puppet. So it is quite likely that if somebody would have wanted to come to live in the GDR, they would have had to have some sort of agreement with the, um, with the Stasi. Um, usually you would have had to kind of offer your services in return. So if this guy um, that you're talking about had killed his wife, I would imagine that the secret police would have also had a good reason to pressure him. Joe Maloney's assorted skills 
and in particular, his love of guns and experience with weapons might have helped him with the Stasi. If he also knew about um, weapons, that would, I mean, then he would have known mostly about Western weapons that would have definitely um, been of interest to them um, to offer like very detailed information on those sorts of things. It's not clear if the German authorities ever knew about Joe Maloney, because if he was in East Berlin, he was there under a different name, as was his wife, Sheila Chandler. But for a man who'd lived almost 20 years under a pseudonym, Michael O'Shea, Joe would have been in a fitting location. The Stasi was really, really good at faking identities for anywhere in the world. So that could potentially have been um, a possibility that they would have, you know, gotten a new identity. But life in East Germany wouldn't have been easy. You know, just everyday life, especially in the 80s, there were a lot of shortages. You had to really stand in line a lot to get just basic goods, basic food stuff. You had to often exchange things with people to get, you know, what you needed. There was just like a lot of struggling with shortages. The winter of 1986 into 87 was a harsh one in Berlin. On Tuesday, January the 13th, 1987, temperatures plummeted to almost minus 20 degrees Celsius. However difficult that day was for Joe Maloney, he was undoubtedly relieved that he had fled Ireland, because on that same day, January the 13th, 1987, the extradition treaty between Ireland and the United States legally came into force. My name is Tom Bush. I'm a retired special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Started my career in the 1970s. Tom Bush is a new source of information for us. In the late 1980s, Tom was the Northeast Supervisor for the FBI's Fugitive Unit in Washington, D.C. And Joe Maloney was on his wanted list. Tom searched for fugitives across the world. Through Interpol, we had interactions with, say, Cuba. You know, uh, the Interpol uh, guys could still go out and do some type of investigation. So there were times in certain Middle East countries where we didn't have a presence, like a State Department embassy or anything like that. But so Interpol would interact with the local law enforcement. And that could, in fact, have happened. Despite their international connections, the FBI had no suspicions that Joe Maloney might be in East Germany. I'm not aware of any cases that I recall when we were dealing with East Berlin, however. It wasn't just the FBI who were keen to capture Joe. Back in Rochester, New York, the family of June Fisk, the woman Joe allegedly murdered, were distraught at the thought of Joe being free, as June's niece, Amy Emmerich, recalls. They were concerned at times about where Joe Maloney was because they kept track. Like, they, they knew he was in Ireland and they knew he might be extradited and then that didn't happen and then he disappeared. And I do know they were concerned about his whereabouts and if he would ever come back to the United States for any reason. So I think that did bother them for a time. In May 1988, almost two years after Joe fled Ireland, his sister-in-law, Sheila's sister, Joan Chandler, died in Dublin. Sheila didn't return home to Dublin for Joan's funeral, which must have been heartbreaking for Sheila and all her family. But it was the price she had to pay to protect Joe as a fugitive on the run. A few weeks after I returned home from Berlin, I heard back from Oscar Bohm in the Stasi archives. The file that showed up as a positive match, it didn't contain any information. I'm disappointed, but not surprised. Without Joe's new fake identity, we were hitting a brick wall. Furthermore, Marion Berthler former Stasi investigator, revealed in a news report with a German broadcaster that the Stasi destroyed many files which they viewed as sensitive. 
She says these shelves hold indications of how many files were destroyed, empty file folders. She says the Stasi tried to destroy as many files as they could through shredding, burning or tearing them up. They took them out of the folders, which now remain. She says they don't know if they can reconstruct the papers that had been inside. They could be in the thousands of sacks of torn paper. On the 9th of November, 1989, just over three years from when Joe and Sheila left Ireland, a huge moment in history took place. I'm Peter Jennings in New York just a short while ago. Astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. The wall that the East Germans put up in 1961 to keep its people in will now be breached by anybody who wants to leave. The East German media chief in the Communist Party said a short while ago that anyone who wants to leave East Germany and go anywhere in the world is free to do so. This was bad news for Joe. As a fugitive, he was now exposed. They'd have to go somewhere else. But where? As 1989 turned into 1990, Joe and Sheila had been off-grid for nearly four years and the FBI and the Garda hadn't a clue where. Back in upstate New York, the authorities began to take a different approach to seek out new information. And they collaborated on two major TV appeals in the US, FBI agent, Gene Harding. I think the fact that he had been in custody in the mid-80s and the fact that uh, we were having trouble finding him at that time, and I think these particular unsolved mysteries, America's Most Wanted, were very popular back in those days. In 1991, a segment about Joe Maloney was broadcast on Unsolved Mysteries, a major TV show in the U.S. Next... An international fugitive is wanted for the cold-blooded poisoning of his own wife. Special Agent Gene Harding, who is handling Joe's case in Rochester, explains why the FBI were now using the media to appeal for information. We, in consultation with the local authorities in uh, Monroe County District Attorney's Office and the U.S. Attorney's Office, said, let's go ahead and give this a shot. Maybe there's a chance that uh, people watching this would have some information for it and uh, we could generate new leads. Again in 1993, Joe's story featured on America's Most Wanted, a huge international U.S. TV crime show. Maloney has spent considerable time in Ireland and has worked as a car salesman. He's probably living under an alias. If you've seen Joseph Maloney, call us at 1-800-CRIME-TV. The FBI were also trying to put the squeeze on people who may have had knowledge of Joe and Sheila's whereabouts. Withholding information on this case was a U.S. felony, an obstruction of justice charge which could bring with it a custodial sentence. Such was the international reach of America's Most Wanted that it aired across the world, Ireland included. We believe that some people in Ireland knew something but said nothing. And some people were shocked when it aired on RTE, like Maureen Power, whose father had dealings with Michael O'Shea. So I do remember Michael O'Shea coming to the house in Castlenock for dinner with my father. Uh, so he sat down and he had a family meal with all of us. He was an entertaining kind of a character. And then a couple of years later, we're watching America's Most Wanted. And uh, it was the time when you'd all kind of sit around watching the TV together. You know, you only had like one or two channels. So lo and behold, on comes America's Most Wanted and... Your man comes on, I hadn't a clue who he was. I was just kind of barely paying attention. My father jumps, oh my God, oh my God, that's him. That's your man, that's Michael, that's Michael. America's Most Wanted did bring in some information about Joe Maloney. That brought in quite a few, quote unquote, sightings of him. That's retired prosecutor, Wendy Lehman. One was in um, Puerto Rico and one was in, I think, Jamaica and one in Canada. There were several of them, but none of them ever panned out. Either he was gone or it wasn't him, or but none of, nothing ever happened with any of those. The FBI, despite drawing a blank, knew Rod Fanning, Joe's friend, who'd picked Joe up from court 
upon his release in Dublin in 1986, had some hand in Joe Maloney's escape, and so they routinely contacted members of Rod Fenning's family, some of whom were US-based, to see if Rod ever said anything to them. When I was in Mexico... That's Vanessa Fenning's husband. Uh, that would have been in the early 90s. Uh, they were still looking for him because an FBI agent got in touch with me. Yeah. The FBI even sent an agent to California to interview Olga, our younger sister. That would have been in the early 90s. Oh, yes, that's right. I went to Los Angeles. Olga Fenning. And uh, the phone rang. I was staying at a friend's house. The phone rang and it was for me, which was like... My God, who knows that I'm here? It was very tiring, I'll tell you, talking to the feds because they kept asking questions, 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 and then they'd ask them again and again just in case you, you changed what you said. Rod was clearly loyal to Joe Maloney because he never let slip about Joe's whereabouts. Throughout the mid-1990s, the FBI's fugitive unit continued to hunt for Joe through FBI field agents and Irish police. Here's Tom Bush, retired FBI. They would have developed those relationships and exchanged information that they had. They would have kept files and records. A lot of that information would have been given to the FBI. So clearly they would have acted on those leads of any individual that could have any uh, knowledge. And they may have done other things too. They could have been watching that particular individual. Joe and Sheila left East Germany after the wall came down. We know this because of what Michael Nage, the English writer on Joe's trail, was told by the German housekeeper at Capard House, Erika Lotz. Sheila and Joe lived in East Berlin until German reunification in 1990 necessitated another move. Rod Fenning still hears from them from time to time. All their money is gone. They're in Cyprus. Oh, don't tell him I told you. Over the last 18 months of making this series, it's been a slow, incremental flow of information. Learning that Cyprus was a possible destination allowed us to join more dots. He sent a postcard to Eric asking about himself, but it was his writing. Peter Collins, the builder Maloney used at Capard House, remembers Eric Lotz received a postcard from sunnier climates, from an unidentified man. What did it say? What did the postcard say? Um, That he was very interested in Michael O'Shea and... (laughs) Um, And he was based in northern Cyprus and, uh, you know... But, I mean, it was just to say, look, I'm OK. <laughs> you know, There's a lot of chat about that postcard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I, I saw the postcard, so it's, it's it, you know, it was genuine. Where is the postcard? I have no idea. I don't know. No idea. I mean, it was Erica's, it was to Erica, but she just showed it to me, you know. What do you think of that? With two leads about Joe and Sheila's new hiding place, we were about to find our third crucial piece of information from Bishop Michael Cox. Michael and his wife, uh, I can tell you straight up, they went to Cyprus. And was that Erica who who told you about Cyprus? And I heard it from somebody else. All this information is new. It's the first time Northern Cyprus, or to give it its official name, TRNC, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, has been publicly placed on the radar as the last known location of Joe Maloney. Northern Cyprus is not recognised by any state other than Turkey. As a result, it has no extradition treaties in force with other countries. Tom Bush, the former head of the FBI's fugitive unit. I'm familiar with, with Cyprus and the, um, the divisions in the, the country. I'm not familiar with any particular or specific fugitive cases that involve that, that region, that area. This is the first time that Tom has heard Joe Maloney fled to Cyprus. And I think um, it just shows you kind of the um, type of guy uh, he was to be able to know. He'd obviously done his research on what countries where he could avoid 
a capture and or at least extradition. Once Sheila Chandler left Ireland with her husband, Joe Maloney, in 1986, she didn't look back. Sheila missed the death and burial of both her sister, Joan, in 1988, and then her father, Vincent, in 1993. But sometime in the mid to late 1990s, Sheila began to come out of hiding. Sheila would come back periodically, always well tanned. That's Vanessa Fenning, sister of Rod Fenning, the man who helped Joe Maloney leave Ireland. And uh, in and out, she'd be in Ireland for maybe, you know, a long weekend kind of thing, and then she'd disappear. And uh, I mean, I'm sure if we really wanted to, we could have figured out where they'd gone to, but we didn't. Coming out of hiding and putting her fugitive husband at risk was a huge step for Sheila to take. But by now, Sheila was ill. In 1995, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and that appears to have changed her perspective. Whatever the reason, coming home to Dublin allowed her to reunite with her mother, her sisters, her close friends. However, Sheila always went to great lengths to hide her trail. When Sheila came home to, um, to Ireland every so often, she went to so many countries to get home so that they would lose track of her. With Joe Maloney now within our sights, in early February 2024, my co-producer Tim and I travelled to northern Cyprus. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to welcome you to Paphos, where the local time is 35 past two. Please so, just touched down in Cyprus at uh, Paphos International Airport now, and we're going to drive the length of the island to go to the border, to go to North Cyprus. We just passed over the border from Greek Cyprus to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, a territory claimed by Turkey. The island was divided in 1974. The Turks took around 37% of the island's territory. And um, this is kind of a lesser visited part of the island. Um, but we're heading up now towards Kyrenia which is where we're going to begin the search for any remnants of Joe Maloney. We're not the first people to follow in the footsteps of Joe Maloney here. Michael Nage came here too, back in 2003, after being told by Capard housekeeper Erica Lotz that this is where he would find Joe Maloney. I left Ireland with the distinct feeling I had come much closer to discovering Maloney's whereabouts than almost anybody else. Whilst an FBI wanted poster speculated that he could be in Ireland, Canada or Germany, I was reasonably convinced that he was in none of those places and could well be in North Cyprus. I felt I'd nothing to lose and flying out there whilst still enthused. With the help of Michael Nage's testimony, together with new information and research available to us. We're hopeful that our trip to Cyprus will confirm the final details of Joe Maloney's life. Hi, Joe. Is it, is it really you? It, 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 it is. You know, ask me a question. I can prove it's me. As we move into our final episode of Runaway Joe, we're stunned to hear from a major character in this story. Someone we only knew until now as a little boy whose mother was poisoned at his fifth birthday party. Wow. Um, well, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just my breath is, is kind of taken away. You've probably been listening to the series, so you know a little bit about, you know, the story that we're trying to tell. And um, Yeah, this whole, whole thing is surreal. Join us for the ninth and final episode of Runaway Joe, Within Sight. As this is a live investigation, if you have any knowledge of Joseph Maloney, a.k.a. Michael O'Shea, please contact us immediately and in confidence via documentaries at rte.ie. Runaway Joe is written, reported and produced by me, Pavel Barter and Tim Desmond. Production assistance by Nicolene Greer. Music is by Martin Kluzak and Tomasz Perot. The sound engineer is Pater Carney. 
and the executive producer for RTE Documentary on One is Liam O'Brien. <laughs>